At the turn of the millennium, pop princess Kylie pulled off one of music's most triumphant ever comebacks. Just as it looked that the Aussie showgirl was destined to fade into pop obscurity, Kylie confounded her critics by returning to the top of the charts. So just how did she make such a momentous comeback? What's the story behind the songs on Light Years such as Spinning Around? Did the song's co-writer Paula Abdul ever regret giving it away? Who originally sang on a night like this and the album track I'm So High? Why didn't your disco needs you get the single treatment? And how does Guy Chambers feel about the song not getting released? So many questions, let's find out. Whilst Kylie is today highly regarded by the public and critics alike, people tend to forget it was a very different story back in the late 90s. A few years earlier, Virgin Radio UK had ran a marketing campaign with the slogan which read, We've made Kylie's songs sound better. We don't play them. Of course, implying Kylie's music wasn't very good. According to Paul Flynn's book, Good As You, Kylie's lawyers rightly made them take the posters down. And her 98 album, Impossible Princess, was a commercial disappointment in Britain. And Kyle's and her record company, Deconstruction, subsequently parted ways. Of course, in the years since, the album has been more positively reappraised and the vinyl released in 22 bettered the album's original chart position by reaching number five in the UK. By 98, it looked as if Kylie Ann Minogue's career was very much on the scrap heap and her time in the sun was coming to an end. Little did we know. Kylie's signing to British label Parlophone was announced in June 99. She was brought on board by Miles Leonard, who had also signed Coldplay, The Verve and Gorillaz, amongst many others. In William Baker and Kylie's book La 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 from 2002, the Aussie diva recounts this interesting interaction which took place at an early meeting with her new bosses. Prior to signing, Tony Wadsworth, head of EMI UK at the time said, yes, we don't have anyone like you. My reply was somewhat out of character. There is no one else like me. According to a classic pop magazine special of the superstar, Kylie's duet with the Pet Shop Boys, who were also another parlophone act, played a part in the record company wanting to sign her. The song In Denial had been an album track on the Pet Shop Boys 99 album Nightlife and the duo were one of the most respected and successful British music acts of the 80s and 90s. Neil Tennant hinted at the story being true, writing in the album booklet of the 2017 re-release of the album. After the failure of Impossible Princess to live up to commercial expectations, the subsequent success of her intimate and live tour, and a whole lot of soul searching, Kylie started to realise what her audience really wanted from her, and what she herself did best. The one name wonder was now crystal clear about her musical direction going forward. Pure pop. In the book La La La, William Baker says there had been record company discussions about turning Kylie into a cross between 90s pop stars Billy and Lolly. Thankfully, that incarnation never came to fruition. Speaking to NME in 2000, Kyle's had this to say about returning to her pop roots. I've realised that I've got to do what I do, even if it's uncool or daggy or camp. According to a number of interviews, Spinning Around was unearthed by Parlophone A&R man Jamie Nelson on a trip to New York when he was looking for songs for Parlophone acts. And as everyone knows by now, the song was written by 80s superstar Paula Abdul, hit maker Cara Diaguardi and two other men. At the time, Paula Abdul's last album, Head Over Heels, in 95, hadn't lived up to commercial expectations. And in the late 90s, Miss Abdul was planning a comeback. Although that planned album was never released and Head Over Heels remains to this day her final album. In Cara Diaguardi's autobiography, One Hell of a High Note, she talks about the writing session for Spinning Around in 98, which was on her lunch break, and it was also the first time she met Paula Abdul. Cara was working for Billboard magazine in advertising sales at the time, and a colleague of hers had played her music to Paula. 
which the 80s superstar was clearly impressed by. Cara had this to say about the writing session and the other co-writers on the track, who were rarely mentioned. Enter the just released from prison co-writer who somehow convinced Paula that he could give her the hit song that she needed. There we were, all in a room together, ex-con, star and an ad sales rep. This co-writer was brutal. He yelled and screamed at me. I think I even cried. No, it's not a hit chorus, he determined, even though he had never written one. A hit chorus was the last thing I was worried about. I was trying to stay true to Paula's story. Cara even moved in with Paula for a short time whilst writing and recording with her. And Cara would go on to be a hugely successful songwriter in the years that followed, writing for almost every major pop star and even becoming a judge on American Idol alongside Paula on seasons 8 and 9. In an interview with the UK's official track company, Mike Spencer, the producer of the track, talked about how he came to work on the song and what the original demo sounded like. People at this point had assumed Kylie couldn't get back inside the top 20. Nobody was falling over themselves to work with her, which is probably why I was lucky enough to get the gig in the first place. Spinning around in its original demo form was a soul record. We upped the tempo and made it into a disco record. We didn't know if it was necessarily the right thing to do, but it felt like a return to what she does best. The Paula Abdul version was a lot slower. It was a different song. The tune, production and concept were all different. I recorded the instruments with the band in London and flew out to do the vocals with Kylie. I met her in a restaurant on Sunset Boulevard on January 4th. She was great in the studio. We spent a week out there recording the vocals and the whole experience was really fantastic. And Mike also said in the interview he got the job producing Spinning Around because Parlophone had been impressed with the work he had done with Beverly Knight. Another Parlophone act and her track Made It Back 99, a remix version of the song which used a sample of Sheik's Good Times. And the record label wanted Mike to capture the same disco energy for Spinning Around. William Baker in the book La 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 talked about his first impressions of spinning around. I heard the song for the first time sitting at the breakfast bar in Kylie's kitchen. The song I listened to was dominated by a hideous status quo style guitar riff in the middle eight and was different from the release version. There was something distinctly unKylie about the song. We were all aware that the next song was crucial for Kylie. A flop would almost certainly mean the end of a pop career for her. Plenty of other songs on the album demo seemed to be more obvious hits. Spinning Around stood out as a song that was distinctly American in its style. And Cara Dioguardi later admitted she wasn't over the moon when she heard the song was going to Kylie. I didn't know who Kylie was and I was heartbroken that Paula wasn't going to do it. But I saw her ass in the video, she had these hot pants on and the video was sick. And I was like, okay, I like Kylie Minogue, I'm going to make some money here. Well, they needn't have worried because Spinning Around became Kylie's first UK number one in 10 years and her first to debut in the top spot. It was also her first number one in six years in her home country and the song that brought Kylie's music career back from the dead. In an interview in 2022 on What Happens Live, Andy Cohen asked Paula if she wished she had kept the track for herself, to which she responded that yes, she did have some remorse about it and that she was performing the song in her show in Vegas. But I think Kylie really made the song her own, not just musically, but also through her superb execution of the song, performatively and visually. And I'm just not sure that Paula would have done the song justice in the same way. In my humble opinion, the song found its right home. On a Night Like This had originally been written for Swedish recording artist Pandora in 97 by the team behind Shares Believe, which of course had been a spectacular success in 98. Unfortunately, Pandora didn't achieve the success that had been hoped for the song, so instead it was given to Kylie to sprinkle some of her magic on it. 
Greek recording artist Anna Vissi also recorded the song in 2000. The video for On A Night Like This was shot in Monte Carlo and was based on Scorsese's movie Casino and Kylie's character on Sharon Stone in the film. It reached number one in Australia and number two in the UK where it was kept off the top spot by Mojo's lady Hear Me Tonight. Kylie had a really focused vision for her pop comeback and the key words in the brief she gave to producers included cocktails, beach, poolside and disco. According to an interview with Kyle's from 2000, the first people she worked on the album with were Robbie Williams and Guy Chambers. Robbie reportedly told her at the time that she had everything, she just needed a few good songs to turn things around. According to Sean Smith's book on the superstar, it was Robbie who thought of the phrase, your disco needs you. Kylie asked him to write a song for her called Love Boat because she really liked the title. And that track would go on to be the opening song on her On A Night Like This tour in 2001. An alliance with Robbie who at the time was arguably the biggest pop star in Britain and one of the biggest in the world positioned Kylie as once again a serious contender in the music industry and gave her relevance when there was a question mark hanging over her stock. And both artists were on the same label EMI at the time. And I'm So High, another Guy Chambers track on the album, was originally co-written with singer-songwriter Megan Smith. She was in a girl group in the late 90s and they recorded the original version of the track themselves and even made a video for it. After the group disbanded, the song was offered to Kylie who adapted the lyrics for herself. Three of the tracks from the album, Please Stay, Light Years and Under the Influence of Love, a cover of a Barry White track, were all recorded in Dublin with pop producer Richard Stannard, who is most famous for co-writing a number of the Spice Girls' biggest hits. In an interview for Mark Andrews' book, Kylie Song by Song, Stannard shared the same sentiments as many fans when it came to the album's final single choice. I would have swapped Light Years with Please Stay. So many people tell me Light Years is their favourite Kylie song. I think the record company found it a little too pink for their tastes. Johnny Douglas, who had worked on George Michael's Older, co-wrote and produced the 60s-inspired song Cuckoo Choo. In an interview with Dutch TV at the time, Kylie commented that nobody really liked the chorus of Cuckoo Choo, but she was determined to have the song on the album. And she didn't know exactly what a Cuckoo Choo is, but she thinks it was taken from a Beatles song. And it can be interpreted, of course, as another word for sweetheart. Johnny also wrote with Kylie my favourite song from the album, Disco Down, which finally got a live outing on 2012's Anti-Tour. Butterfly did well in the States, where it was released to the clubs and made it to number 14 on the Billboard dance charts, Kylie's first appearance on that list in over a decade. The song was actually touted as a potential fourth single from the album, but of course, Please Stay would win out in the end. Produced by Mark Picciotti, who would go on to produce Give It To Me on Fever, Butterfly was one of the songs from the album recorded in LA. And in an interview in 2000, Kylie said that Bette Midler was in the studio down the hall while she was recording Butterfly, and that she met the showbiz legend and that she was ace. And the most hotly debated topic from the Light Years era is still to this day the choice of the fourth single. Your Disco Needs You was undeniably a standout on the album and gone on to be a Kylie classic. But the song surprisingly was vetoed as the fourth single choice with Please Stay making the cut instead. And whilst I really like Please Stay and it's a decent song, it's hard to deny that compared to Your Disco Needs You, the song has been relatively forgotten about. And it has long been reported that Your Disco Needs You never received a proper release because Parlophone felt the song was too camp and it would push Kylie further into a box that in the long run she would find harder to climb out of. 
and Parlophone's long-term plan for Kylie was to develop her music into a more electronic, programmed and contemporary sound and to move beyond disco pop. The song was of course released in Germany with a video shot on a shoestring budget in LA. Guy Chambers in an interview with the Gay Times from 2019 had this to say about the situation. I'm very proud of the song. The only thing that's laced with some mixed emotions is that Miles Leonard, who was the head of Kylie's label at the time, stopped it being a single in the UK. That was painful because it should have been a single in the UK and it would have done really well. When asked if it was true that the song wasn't released because it was too camp, Chambers had this to say. Absolutely, that's what we were told. As if that's ever been something to stop a song from being commercial. There's always been room for camp songs. It's something we need. That part of our culture is very important. Kylie always turns out excellent album covers and Lightyears is no exception. The photo shoot took place at a villa in Ibiza and was done by famed fashion photographer Vincent Peters and he was called on again the following year to do the cover for Fever. William Baker has said that he wanted the Lightyears cover to be a visual statement of Kylie reclaiming her throne as the princess of pop. And in my humble opinion, they definitely achieved it. And as a reminder of Kylie's iconic status, her surname was dropped from the branding. Lightyears became Kylie's first top three album in the UK since Enjoy Yourself in 89. It reached number two in September 2000 and was held off the top spot by the queen of pop herself, Madonna. And no video about the Lightyears era would be complete without talking about those gold hot pants, which steal the show in the spinning around video. The word iconic is used much too loosely these days, but when it comes to Kylie's golden hot pants, they really were. They proved to be one of the most iconic pop culture moments of the millennium, and their origin has become the stuff of pop legend. According to a CNN article from 2020, the gold hot pants were discovered at the North End Market in Fulham, West London by Kylie's long-term friend and photographer, Katerina Jeb. And the pop folklore around the cost of them is true. Katerina paid just 50p for the gold hot pants. That 50p in part helped Kylie to return to the forefront of pop music and did for her what many multi-million pound marketing campaigns can only dream of. But the hot pants were found sometime before the video was made and Kylie had already worn them on a number of occasions. In La La La, William Baker says that the night before the video shoot, he went to Kylie's house to rummage through her wardrobe for potential outfit choices. And whilst there, he stumbled upon the soon-to-be famous gold hot pants. The British press of course became so enamoured with Kylie's backside they launched a campaign to have the derriere listed as a world heritage site of outstanding natural beauty. The gold hot pants have become synonymous with the Aussie diva. They are to Kylie what the meat dress is to Lady Gaga or the conical bra is to Madonna. They've even went on show at the V&A Museum in London in 2007 and today belong to a performing arts museum in Kylie's hometown of Melbourne, Australia. In Paul Flynn's book, Good As You, Don Shadforth, the director of the Spinning Around video, had this to say about the promo and working with Kylie. I think it's to do with how she is a character, not an object. Kylie is Studio 54 in that video. She's carefree, not attached to anyone. She takes the boy to the dance floor. She just wants to dance. She knows when she's given you the performance. She will turn around on set and say, we've got that now, haven't we? And in October 2000, Kylie was watched by 3.7 billion people at the closing ceremony of the Sydney Olympics. Performing Dancing Queen and on a night like this, Kylie's slot proved to be the high point of the evening. Despite the stellar lineup of stars such as Olivia Newton-John, Paul Hogan, 
and Greg Norman. And Kylie's incredible year continued apace the following month in Stockholm where she performed with Robbie Williams at the MTV Europe Music Awards. And Madonna who also performed at the event and who Kylie has long spoken of her admiration of wore a t-shirt emblazoned with Kylie's name. And what could possibly be a higher seal of approval than the Queen of Pop herself wearing your name on a t-shirt? It was something which would have been unthinkable a year earlier. And the following year, Kylie's triumphant comeback was completed with the phenomenal success of Can't Get You Out of My Head, which became her biggest ever single and went to number one in 40 countries. And Light Years was a necessary step in Kylie's journey and set the stage for her to scale even greater heights after. It helped reintroduce the one name wonder and remind people of what she was great at. Light Years returned Kylie to the higher echelons of pop superstardom, where over two decades later, she still remains. Gizmo, do you want to be on camera, Gizmo? Go on, look at the camera. Get ready for your close-up, Gizmo. Oh, there you go. Oh, Gizmo. Good boy. But I think Kylie really made the... They launched a campaign to have the Derriere listed as a World Heritage Site of Art the Derriere listed as a World Health Site, World, World Heritage Site. And don't forget to check out my other Kylie video, which looks at how her 2001 classic Fever was made. Thanks for watching.